Mansour. Dr. Debbie Listerich and her daughter, Aventa, did I get that right? Aventa, will you stand up and let's let everybody greet you. She's also coming from Jerusalem. So the great granddaughter. <laughs> Debbie, I can go on and on about your credentials, but I think we're really interested we're very interested in hearing what you have to say tonight. Thank you so much for making yourselves available to us. Good evening. Um, this is a rather historical visit for me. Uh, it's the first time I've been in Tulsa. Uh, my mother was born in 1915, uh, and she was the daughter, uh, the second daughter of uh, Sam and Julie Travis. Uh, this mansion is where she grew up. And uh, it's the first time I'm here. First time I'm walking in. Yes. And uh, I uh, hope that some of the things I'll be talking will be of interest. Um, my daughter's going to be doing the present power connection. So, um, first I'd like to tell you about the original sources. Since we were dealing with the uh, historical society, I thought it would be appropriate to tell you about the historical research and how I went about doing it. So the um, original sources that I had was a short family tree by Teresa Tedesco. She was a second cousin of my mother's in the US. And she had to prove to the Gestapo um, uh, that she had been living in Paris or in France for seven generations uh, in order to receive um, permission to continue her university studies. Um, so I had this piece of paper that was a photocopy of the tree that she had made for the stomach. It's one of the first pieces of paper I had. Um, and I copied it when I was like 15 years old. Um, my grandmother's cousin, Sally Palmer in London, had made a unique uh, family tree of uh, my great-grandmother's family. Uh, and I had access to that, uh, it was actually a loose leaf. Uh, which he updated all the time for uh, family members. Uh, and he made a unique um, system uh, so that you could go forwards and backwards by Roman numerals and, um, and uh, numbers uh, to find the people that we're looking for uh, by generation. Uh, he did this both for uh, the Kramer family and for his wife's family, the Bolshevik family, uh, which intermarried with other families, uh, these were German Jewish families that all intermarried on the times uh, with each other. Um, my grandmother, when she, uh, about a year before she died, published uh, her memoirs. Uh, she was uh, 86 at the time, but she had kept diaries and she had kept uh, documentation during her whole life. And so she used those as a uh, basis for writing her memoirs including um, actual texts that she uh, had written and translated them into English. Um, her English was near perfect, near a native speaker, even though she grew up speaking French. And uh, she spoke several other languages. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, additional material. Uh, about four years ago, I discovered, I was able to, through the internet uh, and through people who are related to people who are related to other people, uh, get in touch with Michael Ruby. Michael Ruby uh, is a third cousin. His great-grandfather was a brother of my great-grandfather. So Isaac Travis had a brother whose name was um, Zussman Ruby. They were both from the same shtetl in Latvia. Uh, my cousin, my first cousin, Shner Vestritsky, has an archive both from his parents, uh, his mother is still living, my aunt Ida, uh, and also uh, quite a number of documentation from my mother uh, before uh, she moved to California to an old age home near my brother. She uh, left um, boxes of material in New York, which my cousin took care of. I uh, went to a bookworm and by, uh, by avocation, I uh, get Libraries are very magnetic for me in the archives. So I've been in archives and libraries in Paris, New York, and Jerusalem. Uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time in various different places finding documentation. 
archives in various cities in Germany, uh, including Hamburg, Frankfurt am Main, Wertheim, and Zing, um, uh, uh, which um, where some of these places were done by us, by people uh, in Germany who went to these different places for me and uh, sent me the documentation I was looking for, but I knew that it had to be there. Uh, archives in Venice, also by proxy. Uh, my grandmother's second cousin, who was my grandfather's best friend, uh, before he got married, uh, before he even knew my grandfather, uh, was Emil Offenbacher, and he lived here in Tulsa, and um, also lived in New York, uh, was originally from Germany, and uh, he wrote his memoirs. He also wrote, he kept his diaries, a very punctilious, dramatic, uh, we would call in Yiddish, Yiddish um, uh, diaries, where he has very specific dates and uh, information which corroborate my grandmother's uh, memoirs, which is starkly very important because once, you know how it happens in families, people tell stories, but once you have corroboration from a second or a third person, uh, it makes the validity and the reliability of the, of the narrative much, much stronger. So Emil Offenbacher's memoirs uh, validate many of the things in my grandmother's memoirs. Uh, Julie's postcard collection, this was something I didn't even know about. One uh, Saturday night, I get a phone call from one of my first cousins in uh, Israel, who said to, who said to me, um, we have grandma's postcard collection and we don't know what to do with it, and since you're a family historian, perhaps you'd like to have it on loan. I said, of course, because I didn't know what it was. I got a postcard collection of 600 postcards. Well, many of these postcards, or I would say the majority of the postcards, were written from family members to other family members. And <coughs> since then, that Julie was a po collected postcards, um, she, she got all of these postcards. And uh, some of them were, of course, were addressed to her personally. And the postcard collection had actually been started by her brother, uh, Giacomo. And uh, he seems to have lost interest in it when he was about eight years old. And he handed it over to his sister who kept it for years and years and years, and finally gave it to her eldest grandson, who, uh, since that was the major, uh, uh, let's say, um, trend at the time, was a stamp collector. And the children in those years, in the uh, 40s, 50s, uh, collected stamps, and he, um, I would say, uh, bastardized the entire collection by trying to take off all the stamps, <laughs> <laughs> which from a historical point of view was, uh, made it very difficult for me to, uh, to put these postcards back into some kind of chronological uh, sequence and into some kind of, uh, to develop an entire methodology and how to, uh, how to re, re chrono chronologize the, uh, the collection. Uh, then, of course, I was given by my aunt the Neemuna Jubli uh, volume, which uh, Neemuna was the first Orthodox synagogue here in Tulsa. And uh, when they, uh, they put out a Jubli uh, volume when the synagogue was 50 years old, and of course, many of the uh, many of the uh, facts and many of the photographs in the early part of the history of the synagogue uh, related to the Travis family. And of course, Ancestry.com and Jewish Gen were invaluable tools in research. So those are the, those are the sources that I used. Okay, so we'll start with Sam's antecedents. Um, the original family name was Trev. Uh, they came from Metz in the Lorraine area. Um, and uh, Trev was a family name that uh, actually uh, goes all the way back to one of the most famous Jewish rabbis uh, and uh, exegetical uh, Bible commentators named Rush. Um, and um, <coughs> the name changed in 1808 at the time of the Napoleon uh, demands, the Napoleon laws uh, in Germany. Uh, for um, to the name Trifus, and you can obviously see the the uh, similarity 
between the name Trefus and Dreyfus. They're simply different pronunciations of the same name. So it's very possible that the famous Dreyfus family was somehow related way back 300 years ago to uh, our family, but that's not what I can get. Um, uh, in 1845, there was a Russian census, and in the Russian census, we find the following it was Itzko Rabinowitz, son of Yosel. Yosel is a Russian form of Yosel. Uh, he was born around 1780 in Metz. So, this is the first, um, uh, let's say, finding that we have, the first documentation that we have of the Trev family in, um, in uh, Russia, and uh, the name was changed in 1808, uh, not in 1808, but when they came to Russia, uh, before in the 1820s, was changed to Rabinowitz, uh, because before that, uh, Jews were just simply known as uh, the patronymics, just like Russians, uh, with no family names, no, no formal family. Uh, he was married to a lady by the name of Shema. She was born about 1786. Um, she died, and the reason I'm telling you this to you now, is that she died in 1876 when she was about 90 years old. And the reason that that's been, uh, important is because uh, Dave Travis, who built the mansion next door, lived with this lady until he was six and a half years old, in other words. At some point, they, she needed help, and so they sent Dave, who was the eldest in the family, to go and live with his great grandmother. So, um, uh, Itzko, Itzko Rabinowitz was a tavern keeper, uh, which was a very common Jewish occupation at the time. Uh, in the 1840s, uh, the, uh, or, no, in, the, in the 1820s, actually, the, uh, the Russian the Tsar uh, refused to have Jews taking care of taverns and inns. And for a 20-year period, people lost their uh, professions. So it became very difficult. This was, of course, in the Pale of Settlement, which you've all heard of, uh, where Jews were kept at a very low socioeconomic level, uh, many of them, most of them. Um, he had a son by the name of Moshe. That's why it appears in the, uh, in the census, uh, which is uh, the Hebrew, or rather, that's the Russian uh, Transliteration of the Hebrew Moshe, which is the uh, which is Moses in English, uh, and he was born in 1827, married to Dina Friedman, and it's possible that she was the first cousin. Uh, we haven't found actual documentation of this, but uh, Michael Ruby said that he had heard from uh, a great aunt of his that she was a first cousin. Uh, they had three daughters. They had one son and three daughters, Riva, Nina, and Tobin, and uh, four daughters, and Farah, uh, 12. Many of these people, we don't know what happened to them, possibly killed during the home. Um, uh, so our conjecture is that they moved from uh, Metz to Russia around 1820 when there were some groves in uh, the Lorraine area, in Alsace Lorraine against the Jews. Uh, they settled in a rural area, uh, Candelis, which is the northeastern uh, uh, part of Russia, which today is Latvia, uh, near uh, what was then Finsk, uh, or Dagovi Hills today, uh, for those of you who know. Uh, Many of the towns have at least two names, one name in Yiddish and one name in Russian. So if it was Pandelis in Russian or Latvian or whatever it was, and it was Pandel in Yiddish. Um, okay. The eldest child of, um, of uh, Moshe Kuda and Dina Dvara were, uh, was Yitzhak. Uh, Isaac, uh, whose full name was Isaac Naftali Herz. Uh, in the Bible, uh, the sons of Jacob received uh, blessings uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of Genesis, for those of you who are familiar with it, and uh, Naphtali was uh, compared to a, uh, a deer, and Herz is a deer, so very often in Hebrew, the name Naphtali comes with the name deer, 
same time. Um, so he was named for two grandfathers. So his grandfather must have died uh, somewhere between 1845 and 1848 because he was alive at the census in 1845. Uh, the second son was Usman, um, and he was born in 1850. Hi, Miriam. He was born in 1866, he turned 1869. And, um, it, I would assume, okay, Ruby, uh, Mike Ruby has su suggested that they, these were two separate sets of children that were born at uh, different times. I would tend to believe, according to what I know about families in uh, Eastern Europe, that there were a bunch of children who were born between 1850 and 1866, and we'll see similar issues uh, in, in other family members uh, that were born and simply died. Um, child, children who died between the ages of a uh, few months and five years with very, very high mortality rate, in, especially in Eastern Europe. Um, Moshe Abinowitz, um, became involved with Hasidism, uh, the uh, Hasidic group, uh, especially with Chabad, uh, and we, have, uh, we know that he was already uh, involved uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, Pendelis was 95% Jewish, and most of the Jews in this town were Hasidic. There were about four different Hasidic groups in this, in this town. So a very heavy Jewish population and very heavily Hasidic. Um, the Chabad Lubavitch was founded in the 18th century and uh, was already a very strong uh, Hasidic movement at the time. And we find his first affiliation back in 1860. Uh, he was a very learned person and he um, was an unofficial um, rabbi who uh, answered the questions for neighbors and family, uh, but he did not uh, accept any official standing as a rabbi of the community. Um, and he earned his living, uh, again, from being a, from having a hostel, uh, a uh, kind of hotel or inn uh, in uh, Pendelis. His eldest son uh, lived in a place called Lanker, at least in Yiddish. It was also uh, in Latvia. Just to confuse everybody, it had three names. It was called, also called uh, Glasmanke in Yiddish and Gostini in Latin. So if you look it up, you should look up Gostini because the other names, depending on where, where you're coming from, they appear or they don't appear. Um, he was a dairy farmer uh, and had a hostelry. Uh, it seems to have been quite, um, I would say, lower middle class. Uh, even though uh, Dave Travis, uh, as we'll talk about later, didn't have one pair of shoes, and he only wore them uh, when he went to town. He didn't wear them around the farm. He married Ida Miller in 1851. Uh, he was 18, she was 15, and they were married for 16 years. Uh, they had 13 children in 21 years, eight of them survived. And that's a picture of Isaac and uh, Isaac Mutali Ertz and Ida Miller, uh, my great grandparents. Uh, so these are the surviving children Asha, Joseph, Fanny, Barney, Sam, Max, Marion, Sarah. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so you'll see that uh, Asha was born in 1868. Uh, she married Herman Appleman. Quite known here in Tulsa. Uh, Joseph, who took the name Dave, uh, his original name was Joseph, who took the name Dave, not David, Dave, and he's one of the other mansion. Uh, Fanny married Carmen Kornfeld, Barney, uh, his original name was Benjamin, Sam, whose original name was Shlomo, Solomon, uh, Max, uh, everybody in, in America everybody makes the mistake of thinking that because his name was Sam, that his name was Samuel. Solomon, uh, and on all the passports was Solomon, but um, because he was Sam, everybody always makes a mistake of thinking that it was Samuel. Uh, Max was Muttel, if you remember the uh, name of uh, Marion, if you name I don't know, and Sarah. Now, if you take a look, uh, 
you've got between 1870 and 1874, you have a, um, a gap of four years. There was probably another child in there. Uh, you have 1875 and then 1882, you probably have three children in there. And then 1882, 1884, between 1884 and 1888, you would have had another child, and then 1889. That makes your uh, sum of 13 children. So here again, we have uh, evidence of knowing that the family had 13 children, that five died in childhood, uh, somewhere before the age of five. So a little bit about Dave Travis, because he's so famous. Um, probably one of the most famous members of the family. He was known as DR in the family. Um, and he, as I said, he lived with his great grandmother, Shanella Ben Woods, until uh, he was about six and a half. Um, in Pandelis, where he grew up, at some point they uh, lacked for wood for fire on a very cold winter day like today. And uh, this child went out to get, uh, to make a cart and, or a sled to go out and get wood. Well, the wood that he found, when he brought it home, his parents almost had a heart attack. It was crosses that he took from the local cemetery. <laughs> and uh, they very, very, very quickly burnt the whole thing because they were terrified of, of, uh, of its being uh, a reason for a run. Uh, he also went out with uh, a team of horses uh, and a sled with uh, food for the cows in the winter. Uh, this is a child who was constantly doing things and taking the initiative at a very young age. Uh, possibly because he was the eldest, but possibly, I think it's also a question of character. I think it's part of his personality uh, and part of just the way he always did things. But already from a very early age, we see these kinds of uh, anecdotes that stay with them. Um, he mucked the stalls in the, in the dairy farm, uh, but he was afraid of the wolves. And in the world, a uh, lot of the other people in the And the story with the shoes, of not wearing the shoes because he kept them just for going into town. Uh, in 1888, there was a fire in Pandelis, uh, which destroyed uh, 40 Jewish homes, and may have been the reason that families started to leave Pandelis, because there was no problem in the area that would have been the uh, you know, the instigation for, for immigration, but a fire that would have, uh, that would have uh, eradicated a number of the, of the houses uh, would, have, would have been um, a breaking point for a community uh, and could have been one of the reasons why in the late 1880s and early 1890s many of the families from that town immigrated to the United States and uh, actually came to live uh, together. Uh, I don't know if they, if they came with the, with the uh, intention of living in the same area together, but they all gravitated back to living in the same area in Marietta, Ohio. Um, Dave came as a stowaway to the United States, uh, but he declared himself a doctor. Uh, so he came between 1888, perhaps as late as 1890. He claimed that he was here uh, for a number of years before the rest of the family came. We're not quite sure of the documentation we made uh, validate that. His father, Isaac, and his brother, Barney, came next. And then Lita came with the daughters and the younger children in 1891. Uh, Dave sold pencils first in New York City. Uh, some of, somebody from one of the Yiddish Landsmannschaft uh, uh, set him up as for selling pencils. He worked in a farm in New Jersey, according to his own, his own stories to his uh, children. Uh, then he, he uh, became a stowaway and on a train this time. He jumped a boxcar uh, on a train going to California. And here comes the, uh, the interesting story of how he came to settle in Canton, Ohio. Um, he, uh, he had his filling bags, uh, and uh, it, they fell out of the box car. He was holding it, and it fell out. We'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, he got to Canton, Ohio, and he started a scrap metal 
uh, business that sold the metal to uh, Bethlehem Steel, the US Steel. Um, and uh, then he moved to Canada, Ohio, and he went into the oil supplies business. Um, that sort of tied in with the metal scrap metal because they reconfigured the metal for use in the uh, oil supply, the oil well, and the oil well, uh, I don't know, rigs and the other, the other machinery that was needed uh, for uh, oil well. Um, and he started his own company called U.S. Oil and Gas, which went bankrupt after uh, the crash of 1920 when the prices of gas uh, tanked uh, and sort of went down from uh, 25 cents a gallon to 8 cents a gallon or something like that. Um, he started a second company called Lead in 1923, so he picked himself up again, and again we see the same initiatives uh, you see all along the line. Uh, so here you have, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what tefillin are, uh, and they're phylacteries that uh, Orthodox Jewish men put on in the morning uh, around the head and on the arm. Uh, the left arm usually, especially if you're right-handed, uh, on the right arm if you're left-handed. Um, and this is, a Jewish, this is an Israeli soldier with uh, the tefillin. You can see these little boxes here, here and here. Um, and then the leather straps, which are connected. Um, and all Orthodox men put them on in the morning, uh, every morning. And you roll them up, and you put them into a little bag. And um, so this, this, this little bag fell out of his hand and dropped, and he saw that as a kind of sign, a kind of divine sign that that's where he should get off, which is how he got to Canton, Ohio. Um, Moshe Rabinowitz. Uh, Isaac Rabinowitz's father came and visited uh, America in 1905, which is approximately when his son Sussman uh, Rabinowitz uh, came to the United States. Um, when they went back, they bumped into the Russian Revolution in 1905, um, and everything had changed, which made uh, Isaac, uh, which made Moshe Rabinowitz just make some serious decisions of his own, since he didn't like what he saw as far as um, Jewish life in, the, in America, especially uh, out here in the West, um, he uh, decided uh, to do something different, even though his son, Sussman, and his other daughter, Ita, left the United States. Uh, so he picked himself up with his wife, and was this quite an elderly gentleman, and he went to live in the Ottoman Empire part of the Ottoman Empire, otherwise known as Palestine, in 1905. And we have, um, we have uh, documentation of that as well. He was a dangerous woman. And he died in 1911, Dima died in 1910. And that is his grave. And, oh, the way that was her grave, this is his grave. In on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, facing, facing the old city of uh, Sam Rabinowitz Travis was, uh, was associated with Dave and Hyman Appleman uh, in the uh, American, and Isaac, his father, in the American Supply Company uh, till 1906. <clears throat> and then he purchased, his, he, for them, he purchased the material to be repurposed for supplies, as I told you, the scrap metal building, the metal business, uh, used the metal that they got. They didn't just sell the middle, they refurbished it. Um, in 1899, he uh, drills his first, uh, his first well, his first oil well in near Marietta. I was not very successful. Uh, in 1909, he purchased a machine shop in Independence, in Kansas, uh, and we sold it in 1905. Uh, he uh, started with the new wells near uh, Cleveland, Oklahoma. Uh, and these were the first wells that actually brought in quite a nice income. Um, <clears throat> 1905 to 1909, he drilled 15 wells adjacent to Tulsa. And in 1909, he sold his shares and he opened his own company called Petroleum, uh, the Oklahoma Petroleum Gas Company. Uh, the income that he had was uh, $10,000 a month. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
done that. Uh, GPT calculations has been born in, in uh, 1882 when he started, I think when he started working with his brothers. He was quite young. He was uh, what we would call today a high schooler when he started going out and, and being part of the business for the uh, scrap metal business. Um, so here he's a young man of 1909 and his income is $10,000. Um, in 1910, he was one of the first pioneers of building compression plants to liquefy gas, uh, produced by the oil into gasoline. Uh, and he was, seems to have been a, quite a pioneer in this area, um, and was quite proud of that. Uh, he wasn't the first one to, to, to start the, the, the methodology of this, but he was one of the first people to bring it out here uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, his business center was in the Mayo Building, which still exists today. And he had uh, 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 17 rooms in uh, an entire floor of the Mayo Building. Uh, my daughter and I are staying at the Mayo Hotel, so that's uh, a nice little sort of. Uh, what was interesting about this uh, company that he had was that he closed the company on Sabbath and Jewish holidays, uh, so as not to uh, uh, go over the uh, biblical injunction of working on the Sabbath. In fact, he had a non-Jewish partner who, since they couldn't close the wells on, on the Sabbath, so all of the uh, receipts, all of the profit from the wells on the Sabbath were given over to a non-Jewish person. So actually, all of his profits were just from the six days. Um, he purchases in 1915 oil wells in Nowata for $800, which, given the amount of money that he was making, was quite cheap. And uh, they were used mainly for producing gasoline. He lays 100 miles of four inch pipelines from the wells to, the, to a plant uh, for refining. The cost of the plant, however, is $250,000. Uh, he built 40 wells in the Bur Burnett area of Texas. And he built a refinery there for $100,000. Uh, the unsuccessful venture, which was in the Mejia oil field, uh, he resold for $300,000, which allowed him to barely recoup the uh, amount of money that he had spent buying the wells and drilling unsuccessfully, um, it turns out the wrong kind of, of, of uh, drilling equipment for that geological formation. Um, this is the part I'm actually talking about things that I don't know about. But when it comes to the geology and, and the whole refinery business, I um, can't tell you that I'm very much of any uh, of <clears throat> At the end of 1918, um, he had 10 cars uh, that held 8,000 gallons. Uh, he delivered 30 tank cars daily. The price was 25 cents per gallon, and he owned 250 ten cars and needed to rent more. So you can get an idea of, of how vast this, this uh, business was at this time. Uh, he may have also been a partner with Marion Travis in the Midco Oil Company, his younger brother. Okay, so the sales of this oil, that this gasoline that he, was, uh, that he was manufacturing, was going uniquely to one client, and that was Standard Oil. And as anybody who's in business knows, you don't go to business in you know, one client. Uh, it's a recipe for disaster, which is exactly what happened. 1919 Standard Oil signs with another company, like Chestnut. I have not found any information about this. Uh, so instead of a net profit of $160,000 monthly at this point, uh, January 1919 shows a loss of $30,000. So you can imagine not only did he not make the $160,000, but he had a loss of $30,000. The price of wildfire sales brought the gasoline uh, down to uh, 8 cents a gallon. And he had to pay for a demurrage for each one of the cars, the tank cars that he had, which was $5 a day, uh, plus the rent for the rented cars that he had. Uh, 
and he had to get rid of all this stuff. Um, so he ended up with a he went up very quickly with a debt of six million dollars. Um, so you have to imagine that this man who had spent, who had bought, who had built this house, uh, and who had been quite fabulously wealthy, uh, all of a sudden found himself with a debt of six million dollars. Uh, he was very lucky in getting a um, a loan from the Exchange National Bank, run by the Sinclair Brothers, who were very famous here in Tulsa. And uh, the Sinclair Brothers told him to take his time and to, uh, they wouldn't pressure him uh, for this loan. And he spent the next uh, uh, 18 months getting out from under this debt of $6 million. Uh, I remember a conversation between Sam, my grandfather, and my father. And my father once said to him, uh, Sam, tell me, how come you just didn't take a million dollars in, in, in trust for each one of your children, your seven children? And my grandfather answered and said, Toby, I never thought that so much money could disappear so quickly. Um, so the uh, sale of gasoline plants and the tank cars was to Time Water Oil, uh, oil Company. And uh, so that, that's approximately the, I would say, the cycle of the business cycle of Sam Travis here in Tulsa uh, until about 1920, 1921. He did get back on his feet, but never to the extent that he had been before. In other words, he never recouped to that level of wealth that he had uh, before 1919. Um, but back in 1913, he still wasn't married. And he was looking for a mate. He had gone to New York several times to look for a nice Jewish lady who was Orthodox and whom he could marry. Um, and uh, had found him very compatible. So uh, his best friend Emil Offenbacher was about to set off to Europe. And uh, he said to him, Wait, I'm coming with you. And so Sam Travis set off to Europe with Emil Offenbacher. And uh, they left. In April 8th of 1913, and this information I have from Emil's uh, diary from his uh, memoirs. And they go to visit Emil's cousins, Abraham and Sophie Tedesco, in Paris, uh, on their way to Germany for the Passover holiday and on their way to Italy for sightseeing. Uh, they pass through Paris and they visit this family who were who are cousins of, uh, of uh, Emil. And he falls in love with the daughter. Julie Tedesco. And uh, they quickly send all sorts of uh, telegrams to rabbis and to banks, uh, some of the famous Orthodox rabbis here in America, uh, specifically Rabbi Leventhal and Rabbi Sibitz, uh, to, uh, to vouch for his character and to vouch for his orthodoxy and to vouch for his bank account and uh, make sure that he was the kind of person who would be uh, uh, acceptable to the Tedesco family. So this is Sam Travis around 1910. And that's Julie Tedesco around 1913. And they got engaged in Paris on the 12th of June, 1913. It was just a little bit more than a few years ago. And they uh, got married on July 13th. Uh, Julie, of course, becomes an American citizen by marriage. And they set off for a honeymoon to Tulsa. Of course, everybody in Paris uh, was appalled, you know, like, how can you go to Indian country? And you have the wild Indians out there, and uh, she still went out to Tulsa, Oklahoma. What? In the summer, that's a nice weather. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, they stayed in Tulsa until uh, September when they returned to Paris. Um, Julie's father had made uh, Sam promise that he wouldn't take Julie to live in America, that she could visit but not to live in America, uh, because uh, he didn't want to lose his oldest daughter uh, to America and he wanted to be able to have her near him. So uh, that was one of the conditions to the, to the wedding, uh, to the marriage. And so they returned to Paris and set up home in Paris um, at the, towards the end of September before the Jewish holidays, the, the uh, New Year holiday and, and Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement. And of course, uh, 
other half of the town. Um, so they lived in, um, uh, so Sam goes back to America in December of 1913 uh, and comes back to Paris in March of 1914. He still had business here, and he was still taking care of his business in Tulsa, and he was doing this back and forth business, which was slightly more extended than you know, time wise. It was, a, it was at least a two week trip uh, between a three day train trip to New York and then taking a taking a, um, a ship to Le Havre uh, in, near Paris. And so uh, he was doing these jobs. So between December and March, he was back here in, uh, in Tulsa. Uh, and then in the end of 19, uh, uh, April 1914, Julie's father passes away, um, which was a very traumatic um, uh, experience there for, for that family. And um, in mid-May, Julie gave birth to her eldest daughter, uh, Adine, uh, who was born in Paris, obviously. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this family is that their children were born in, like, all over the world. Uh, so that's the engagement picture of Julie and Sam. Um, Jacques Montedesco um, was her grandfather, and he was born in the Jewish ghetto of Venice in 1799. Well, actually, the Jewish ghetto had been opened in 1797 uh, by Napoleon. Uh, and he was born two years later. But after Napoleon left, the Austrians who came and reoccupied Venice uh, reclosed the ghetto. So he actually grew up in a closed ghetto, at least a partially closed ghetto. Um, and this, of course, was the oldest ghetto in Europe uh, from, from the 15th century. Uh, he immigrates to Paris, and uh, we have uh, we have the earliest confirmation of his uh, of, of his activities in Paris in 1832, uh, when he founded a synagogue, an Orthodox synagogue. Um, don't forget that Europe was then going through uh, Jewish Europe was going through uh, the turmoil of uh, reform, and uh, many of the many of the congregations chose to be reformed rather than to be Orthodox, and there was big. Uh, uh, controversies. Uh, in any case, um, Giacomo Tedesco opened the first Orthodox synagogue in Paris. Um, we have a Jewish uh, Jew marriage contract known as the Ketubah from 1833. And he married to the self, who was born in 1811 in the Moselle area, uh, which was like part of that. We also have a the etiquette from uh, the art gallery. Now here you have this very orthodox Jew who has an art gallery which was, uh, it was just in burgeoning uh, commerce at that time, art galleries. It was just, just beginning. Uh, until then it had been a government, uh, a, a government limited uh, uh, business. And uh, art galleries just started in the 1830s, late 1820s, early 18, excuse me, early 1830s in Paris. And he had one of the very important galleries that um, uh, that was um, called the Galerie Tedesco, and which uh, was uh, concentrated on the Barbizon School, which was the school of art that preceded the Impressionist. Impressionism, everybody knows, Monet and Manet, everything. So, this is the school of art that came forth. Um, this is Jean Pinot's Italian uh, birth certificate. And then, this is the Ktuba, the Jewish marriage contract, and that's the etiquette. Um, this is already a later etiquette, you can see that it says, Maison fondée en 1833. Okay, it says uh, the house, in the words, that the business was founded in 1833. That's Jacques Montedesco, and that's his wife, Therese. So, they had 11 children. These were not small families, as you can see. Um, Adelaide, Rosalie, Anna, Julie, Clementine. So, they had a bunch of girls first, uh, and then they had, um, right? Right, and then just in 1846. Emma in 1847, Arthur in 1848, they all 18, 1853, so that 1854. And 
finally, Ablam in 1856, uh, that's my great-grandfather. Uh, so he was the youngest of the 11 children. And um, the eldest daughters all married into uh, famous rabbinic families in Europe. And I won't start going into all the names and everything, which probably don't mean very much to you. But um, if you can think of all the... And the thing was that uh, Jacques Renaud insisted that his children marry um, uh, marry Orthodox uh, spouses from Germany because there weren't enough uh, Orthodox families in France at the time. So they all married Germans, and so the girls went to live in Germany actually. And so you can imagine that in the following generation, uh, by the time we're talking about 1914 and the First World War, you had cousins who were on opposite side of the uh, of the armies. So um, this Jacques Tedesco had this very famous uh, Galilee uh, Tedesco in Paris, was also very famous for his uh, community work, uh, so the, well, the, Orthodox, the small Orthodox community in Paris. Uh, he helped found the synagogue. He helped found a Talmud study group. Uh, much later on, these two uh, organizations or associations actually combined to become one because of the changing laws in Paris and we'll go into that, but uh, they, they still exist. Uh, he, found, he helped build the first ritual bath, otherwise known as a mikvah, uh, in Paris. It was the first one built since the French Revolution and it was in service until World War II and uh, it was the only one in Paris. Uh, he was also a mohel, somebody who did uh, ritual circumcision for baby boys at uh, the age of eight days. And he was also the one to open up a kosher butcher shop, uh, which uh, was one of its kind because until then, kosher meat was sold uh, in, the, in the regular butcher shops. And uh, you know, one side was kosher meat, the other side was non-kosher meat. And you know, there wasn't enough kosher meat, so they, <laughs> this was a problem, by the way, in New York as well, uh, uh, many years later. Uh, but uh, he decided that you know that wasn't good enough for him, so he opened up a kosher butcher shop, and they had to get special licensing for it. Um, during the actually during the War of 1870, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, when uh, food was rationed uh, during the siege of Paris, uh, people who wanted kosher meat could only buy it at the Tedesco. Uh, shop. Okay, so in the gallery, they sold paintings by Delacroix, Messonnier, Corot, who was a bonheur. These are just a few of the very famous names. Uh, of, uh, and uh, Jacques Montedesco was almost um, one of the prime sellers of these awards. It was in the hundreds of paintings. We're talking now not about three or four or five of these paintings, but hundreds of these paintings went through the gallery. Um, the uh, ledgers of the gallery from 1860, no, yes, from 1860 till 1942, uh, when the Nazis uh, raided the gallery uh, and looted the art, uh, are in the um, are in the Getty Institute in California, in Los Angeles. Uh, so those ledgers exist, but the early ledgers from 1833 to 1860 are missing. Uh, but we have uh, letters from some of these artists to uh, Giacomo Tedesco, so we do have some documentation. And of course, when, when you look at the provenance of many of the paintings, you can see that they came from the uh, Tedesco gallery. Um, so this is the Franco Prussian War of, of uh, September 1870 to January 1871, and the Siege of Paris. Uh, the siege of Paris was so bad that people ate uh, the animals in the zoo. Um, they butchered the animals in the zoo for, for food because they just they ran out of the cattle uh, that they had in the city that they had prepared for during the siege. And even though this wasn't a very long siege, but they 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 did not um, use uh, modern calculations for uh, apportioning the. the what they had, and therefore they ran out of food very quickly. And uh, so you had a famine in Paris. 
um, which is very, which is very bad. And like, as I said, uh, they use the animals in the, in the uh, zoo, and once that's finished, uh, then you, uh, then they did look for other animals, horses, dogs, cats, whatever else was there. Um, and Jacques Montedesco died uh, during the famine of the siege of Paris in 1870. Therese de Despo had preceded him uh, and died of natural causes in 1867, and the son Joseph Tedesco took over as head of the family at that point. Tedesco was therefore orphaned uh, at the age of 11 from his mother and at the age of 14 from his father. He was really a very young child uh, when he was orphaned from both his family, from both his parents. Um, so this is a scene of a butcher shop during the siege of Paris, and you can see the lines waiting to receive a portion of meat. Uh, meat was apportioned according to the number of, uh, you received a certain number of grams of meat, half by ounces, uh, per person in the family, and you had to be able to prove that those people lived in your, your attic. And these are people that are looking for rats uh, during the siege of Paris. These were actual uh, sketches that were done at the time. Uh, the first great cholera epidemic in Paris was in 1832, so that's the year that we know that Jacques Montedesco was already in Paris. Uh, and there were 18,000 people who died in this cholera epidemic, uh, just in Paris, not in all of France. And the second great epidemic was 17 years later in 1849, uh, and at that time, 20,000 people. So in 1873, there was a small epidemic, only 600 people. By this time, people already knew quite a bit about cholera. They didn't know all really the bacteria that caused it, but they, um, they, they knew something about it, and they knew how to manage, at least partially, uh, some of the uh, problems of the, of the, um, of the cholera. Uh, but Emma and Martha Tedesco die in this cholera epidemic, and uh, also, uh, the son of their sister, Rosalie, who had come in from Germany to visit the family, and her young son of nine years old, Israel Alexander, died at the same time. So we have found documentation of all these three people dying in cholera epidemics. This goes into the whole question of medical uh, history of families. So in the second generation in Paris, we're left with just the three brothers, uh, the three surviving brothers, because all the sisters were living in Germany and Jean-Léon Marlon, who live in Paris, and they take over the gallery, which now becomes known as uh, Frère de uh, They are, uh, they marry Orthodox German Jews, and this already. Uh, they moved to Passy, which was a new area in Paris, uh, which today is the 16th of Arrondissement. Uh, which would be like uh, the poshy area of any, of any city, you know, like the Park Avenue of, of uh, New York City. Uh, the 16th of Oli Smoke today is, is a very poshy area, and they built uh, their houses there. Uh, they uh, uh, built a new synagogue there. It's also an Orthodox synagogue. It's a sister synagogue to the one that they had grown up with. And they were very involved with the community work. At this point, the Orthodox community uh, and had much more uh, connections with the Consistoire, which was the central uh, organization of Jewish communities in, in, in France. Um, that's, a, that's a picture of one of the ledgers, the Getty, uh, from the gallery. And this is Abraham and Sophie Tedesco, my great grandparents uh, from my grandmother's side. And this is a picture of uh, her brother, Jacques Long, who was named for the grandfather, and her sister, Flora, who was a little dark-haired girl, and that's my grandma, who was about 18 months older there. Uh, not, definitely not more than 18 months. Um, and uh, uh, her brother, uh, Flora isn't mentioned in my grandmother's memoirs. Um, and when I was about six, or 17, I had a conversation with my grandmother and I asked them how can they roll with three children, given that they both came from very large families. And my grandmother said to me, well, we were actually four, sort of very defensively. And I said to her, four? I said, I've never heard of anybody else except been for your brother and your younger sister. Uh, this is not a mistake, obviously. 
And she said, yes, I have a sister by the name of Flo. Well, when I started doing my, I, I said to her, well, what happened to her? She said, oh, she died young. End of conversation. When I started doing my research and I tried to find this flaw, I found her birth certificate. I did not find anything else. Now, in European birth certificates, you very often have in the margins information about later um, civil acts. For example, where to find the marriage certificate or a death certificate. And it's usually corresponding. You have a, you have a correspondence between the different civil, uh, civil documentations. There was nothing. There was no death certificate. I found it to this girl grave in a German town called Bendorf Zane. Uh, would that be, uh, who was born in Paris? I said, she said to me, would that be somebody from your family? So, of course, I went right into this, uh, Googled it right away, and I found uh, the information. And it turned out it was, it was uh, Lola's grave. So I knew she died in Bendorf Zane. What the heck she was doing in Germany, in this little town in Germany, I had no idea. So I did a little more research and I found out that um, there was a Jewish Orthodox psychiatric hospital uh, in Bendorze. It had about 120 beds. Uh, it had kosher food. It had a uh, synagogue. Uh, they treated all, everything from Alzheimer to schizophrenia. Uh, they had a number of, when I went through the, the list of patients there, uh, I found a number of very famous rabbis who had become old and had Alzheimer's, uh, who had been sent there. Uh, people who had uh, alcoholism, uh, as I said, schizophrenia, and other medical, uh, psychiatric medical issues uh, that were not as differentiated as they are today and often very not treated very well. Um, and I wanted to find out more about what she was doing there. I mean, like, how did she get there? I mean, like, that was the only possible solution as to what she was doing there. Um, and um, I wrote to a person in Germany who has done an incredible uh, amount of work uh, at the memorial of this uh, institute. And he uh, told me that, um, uh, that, that there were no documentation Institute because everything had been burned by the Nazis. Obviously. One of the big dead ends in, in European Jewish research is the whole Holocaust period where you get these holes of information which you absolutely cannot fill. So I said to him, well, if she died in Bedrock saying she must have had a municipal death certificate. I said, can you go and see if there's a municipal death certificate? It was. And that's when we found out that she had died of a grand mal uh, epileptic seizure. And what happened was, this is I pieced together from other information afterwards. I, once I knew this, I was able to piece together other information. She uh, became epileptic at quite an early age, before the age of seven. And um, she, uh, she was institutionalized at the age of 15. She lived there until the age of 27. Uh, so very, very, very sad stories. And but this was, of course, if the story of the of the uh, Holocaust is something that the family knew, about, and I just had to find the information and the documentation. This story nobody even knew about. They didn't even know her name. They didn't know that she existed. Most of the people in the family had never heard of her name. And uh, when I brought this up, it was very apparent that epilepsy was something that you did not talk about. When doing family research, you have to be able to look also for these these things that are taboo to talk about and, and to find them out. And it's today our attitude of the uh, Jacques Mo was born in 1887, Flo in 1889, Julie in 1891, and in 1898, Alice, whom I knew very well. Uh, in summer of 1914, uh, my grandmother, a pregnant baby, and her mother, who worked with my great grandmother, and her sister went to Königstein in Germany to visit um, her sisters. Um, a very famous villa, Goldschnitt, that's there. And, um, and they uh, were there in the summer. And of course, that was not the time to be in Germany because in August, the war broke out. And of course, these are French citizens, as I think my grandmother was then already an American citizen. And it was a question of 
how do you get up Germany and get back to France? Especially since uh, my grandmother's brother, Giacomo, was in the army and was a uh, captain in the, in the army. That's the outbreak of the war on August uh, 28th. Sam, of course, was in America. And he was supposed to have rejoined them towards the end of August uh, in, uh, in Königstein and for some support. So my grandmother's uh, brother uh, was uh, in the war in, in Guadalupe, which was a very famous area. It was almost as bad as Belgrade. Uh, it was eventually liberated by uh, the Americans. Came in. Uh, my grandmother decided to reunite with Sam. She said this was long enough. So in February 1915, she took uh, um, a ship by herself, her baby. Uh, and came to America by herself during the war period and submarines and everything else and braved, braved the entire world, uh, quite lucky I think, uh, embarked from Genoa, Italy because she thought it would be safer for uh, the southerly route to the United States and she uh, arrived in America safe and sound. Uh, in 1917, um, Uh, 
the Jewish kids at the public school, and my grandparents decided that this just wasn't good enough for their standards. So they decided to pack up their family, and they took up the children and sent them to school in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, which had one of the most famous Jewish day schools uh, named for a uh, famous Jewish rabbi called Samson Rufayim Hirsch, uh, who was um, one of the uh, new orthodox uh, rabbis who fought in So Adin, Miriam, and Abi were sent, were brought by their parents, or by their mother, I think, uh, to Germany, to Frankfurt am Main. Adin and Miriam were set up with the uh, family of the um, principal of the school, of the high school, and Abi lived with the principal of the uh, elementary school. Uh, Miriam at the time, my mother, was about 10 and a half years old. Just shy of 11 years old when she came to Um So Julie went back and forth between um, uh, Julie and Sophie. My grandmother traveled with Julie and Sophie back and forth, because Sophie was really very good girl. She was like five, six years old. So uh, four years old for somebody. And they, um, so she traveled with her back and forth and she visited the children in Germany. Uh, Sam was basically stuck in the United States during Christmas. Um, in 1926, Sam's mother, Ita Travis, passes away and uh, is, very, is brought to Israel for burial. Uh, we, I just found, or it was just sent by my cousin Schneer, the uh, eulogies that were uh, done in, in um, Jerusalem. And uh, amongst them was the then chief rabbi uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, 1928, uh, my grandmother finally decides that this is enough traveling back and forth between Germany and, and Tulsa, and she takes an apartment in uh, Tulsa, in, in front of mine, uh, also because she was pregnant. And in September of 1929, Ida and Joe, my aunt and uncle, twins, were born in uh, Frankfurt. So, so far we have Tulsa, North uh, Paris, Tulsa, uh, New Jersey, uh, Germany, and the South Africa. Uh, in 1930, there was a bar mitzvah of Abi in Frankfurt am Main, and also in that year, uh, Sam's father passes away and is also brought. I mean, you have to imagine this that the, uh, his, the Sam's mother and father were brought from Tulsa all the way to Jerusalem. We're not talking about airplanes, uh, to very uh, And we're very young in, in the same plot where uh, Moshe, uh, Yuda, and Dina Dvar, we don't know what's happening there uh, on the Mount of Olives. So this is like a six week trek that Dave. Travis and Jerusalem. Um, 1932, uh, Sam goes back to America for uh, business. And Julie follows with the six children after nine months, and uh, he thought they would go for a few, for a few months, and then he goes back to Frankfurt, but that didn't work out, so she goes back to Germany to the United States with six children. And they land up in Dallas, Texas at this point. That's the school in Germany. That's my my grandmother. That's my grandmother. Uh, this is the eldest daughter, Adine, my mother Miriam, Abby, Sophie. And then down here, if you can see them, the two, the twins. So she's traveling uh, with all six children. That's my cousin's daughter, um, who uh, went with her father down to Dallas, Texas, and that's the house that they lived in in Dallas, Texas. Uh, in 1933, in Dallas, Texas, my youngest aunt was born. Uh, her name's Ruth. She lives uh, two blocks away from me. In Israel, and that is a dean holding her. Um, the doctor came to deliver, to help my, my grandmother give birth at home, and the uh, nurse didn't arrive. And so he called this 19 year old girl, a dean, to come and help her. So she helped deliver her sister. And then years, and that's why I took that picture. There's another picture of my mother holding the baby, but I 
book, this was particularly So, of course, 1933 is the rise of Nazism, and uh, Isaac Travis passes away. And in 1934, my grandparents decide, okay, this is the time to really do something that we really believe in, and we're going to go and live in Palestine. A very Zionistic family, so they go in the 1934, they pack up seven children, including a one year old baby, and they pack up from Dallas, Texas, and go and live in imagine this very nomadic life that my grandparents did. Um, and that's my mother with uh, my aunt Ida, one of the twins on her lap, uh, on the ship going to uh, Palestine. And once they were in Palestine, so that's my aunt Adine, who's 20 years old and who's marrying, who married Israel Hildesheimer, and uh, that's their wedding picture. And that's my mother, and an engagement picture to her first husband, Alfred Oppenheimer. Um, they had two children, uh, born in Israel and Palestine at the time. And um, so, we are some Palestinian families. Um, that is Julie and Sam Travis with Emil Offenbacher and the twins in uh, Israel, in Palestine in the 1930s. And that's Ruthie when she was about three years old. And in an advertisement for peanut butter, because my grandfather decided to make peanut butter, which did not go very well. It's a venture that was very successful. But he tried to make peanut butter, and that was the advertisement. Um, if Sam went back to the United States for work for, for the oil wells again in 1938, and being that he got involved with the business issues again, so Julie packed up the children, uh, at least the five that weren't married, and came back to the United States in 1939, uh, and they left on the Chateau Uh That's the picture of the ship that they took. That went back to first to uh, Marseille, um, and they took that um, from Marseille. They took the train to Paris, of course, and visited the family in Paris, and had a great time. And a number of different uh, stories about that visit that we're running out of time. So, I'll try to remember. 1939 to 1954. So, Sam and Julie live in various places throughout the Midwest, in uh, Indiana, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, Texas. The younger children are in Jewish schools in Chicago. By this time, Jewish education had taken off in the United States, and we had a number of serious Jewish uh, day schools for, for uh, parochial, like parochial schools. And so they were in schools in Chicago. Uh, and of course, the family would get together for the Jewish holidays, uh, and sometimes in between, but basically Julie and Sam were going from place to place uh, following uh, the oil wells where they were being drilled at the time. Sophie marries in 1946 and divorces, and then remarries in 1950. Ida gets married in 1948. Miriam divorces and remarries in 1951. And I am just going to be second marriage. Uh, Aaron Hildesheimer, uh, my aunt Adine's youngest son, not the youngest child, but youngest son, was being born in 1954, at which time Sam and Julie Travis decide to make Aliyah. Uh, at this point, we call going to the Inuvik to Israel uh, area. And uh, they have they passed several different wars in 1956. Uh, Sinai campaign in 1967, uh, six-day war uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, in Sam dies in 1969. And Judah died in 1978. And they were both 87 years old when they died. Uh, it's not a big difference because they had this from some age of the And at the time that they died, they had 25 grandchildren. I only did an attempt to count the great grandchildren and the great grandchildren since then. Uh, the eldest, my grandmother, was still alive when her eldest great granddaughter uh, got married. And Michal's husband. Rafi Peretz is today the chief rabbi of the armed forces of Israel. Let's see you in the soccer.
Yes, exactly. They were they were in anti antiques and they were very important art collectors. And a, a sister of my great grandmother was very Yes, we uh, 
we, the, the legend in the family was that it was Rockefeller, who was not very uh, pro-Semitic. Yes. 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 My mother lived Tulsa. In other words, it didn't matter where else she lived after that. For her, her identity was very, very much, I think more than almost anybody else in the family, was very much the Tulsa experience. And, and I grew up with Tulsa stories all the time. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why it took me so long to get it. So, <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, several years ago, I gave a course on, or a class on the history of uh, Tulsa Jewish community. And taking my notes, I, this is kind of an amusing story. In 1960, Marion Travis involved, was involved in the building of the Banana Wood of 1919 South Carolina. Shortly after the synagogue was built, Travis and the Aronson family had a business dispute, which became personal. In 1917, the Travis family withdrew and conducted services in their own home. Yes. A year later, Travis became president of the Namun, and Aronson withdrew and built his own sanctuary <laughs> in his own home. Yes. The, the, um, I think that what happened was that this, uh, um, well, it was a little bit funny because the Aronsons were married into the Travis family, uh, as you may know. Uh, and um, exactly what happened between the Aronsons and the Travises, I'm not quite sure. But it may also have had to do with the synagogue services and whether women were going to sit with the men or not going to sit with the men and, and things like that. Um, there's another very amusing story that was told at some point that, you know, these, um, having the honor of uh, leading the prayer was, was considered uh, very important. And so sometimes these uh, oil men who would come in to their afternoon or evening uh, services uh, would get into an argument one with the other about who was going to lead the congregation. And uh, one, in one of these altercations, they started throwing some of the wood benches at each other. <laughs> and they turned to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, don't worry about it. We have enough money to <laughs> No, I'm supposed to be him. <laughs> Hi. You all can share stories. <laughs> yes. Were Marion and Barney in the oil business with David? Well, Barney went to live in Kansas. So he may have been in the oil business down in Kansas. I'm in contact with his uh, grand, 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 okay. grand. He didn't live here for a while. No. He, he, lived, he lived for a short while in, in Tulsa. Uh, but basically, he almost directly from Marietta, he went uh, to uh, Kansas. Okay, we know where Marion's home is. Right. Yes. We, we had, uh, well, I have an address here for Barney, actually. Uh, uh, okay. Pardon? Do you have any idea where Barney's house was? Because they all lived around the same area. Yes, um, but I didn't bring it with me. Uh, and it's something that my, my cousin, Joan, uh, asked me, Joan Krause, asked me to photograph. Yeah, Ruth, you mentioned Ruby. Uh, I met him here in Tulsa uh, 20 years ago. Which would be? Well, Michael's, Michael's uh, uncle? Uh, he was a gentleman about my age, and uh, someone kind of he called me. Someone had told him to call Michael me. Michael Ruby. Right. And Michael he, Ruby works for, um, first of all, he's a poet. He's uh -huh. published several books of poetry. He said, though, he's not very young. Well, I mean, I think it's 20 years ago. I don't know. Well, I, I didn't know him 20 years ago. I think it was tight, but. Yeah. Um, uh, he's, a, he's a gentleman who's, who's published a number of uh, books on poetry and he works for Wall Street Journal. He, uh, he writes for Wall Street Journal. And he's done quite a bit of the, uh, uh, quite a bit of the research uh, on, uh, on the Travises in Candelas and in uh, Dunkirk. Uh -huh. This one was the residence at that time. Mm -hmm.